Each year, we clear the schedule during December for holiday-related stories. But with the new year behind us, we're going to dive down into the larger stories unfolding in the world around us. This is our big update to kick off 2022. Today, we'll take a look at what's happening in terms of the parks, films, and other areas of the Disney Company. We'll also offer analysis as to where current trends will take us in the months ahead. But before we get there, I need to thank a few new Bandcamp subscribers. These are the people who keep this podcast going. Without them, we'd simply be forced to close up shop. Unless people subscribe, there's no way to make this ongoing podcast a viable venture. So gratitude is going out today to Brian, to Kenny M, Arlo, and Cynthia. Thanks to each of you for supporting this podcast. You're a large part of the reason that this show keeps going. Well, there's no other place to start really than with Omicron, as this new variant is placing pressure on nearly every aspect of the Disney company. Back on October 18th, Disney announced that it was shifting the release dates for a group of high-profile films. Doctor Strange was pushed back from March 25th to May 6th. Thor Love and Thunder was pushed back from May 6th to July 8th. Black Panther 2 was bumped from July 8th to November 11th, and so on. In short, many tentpole movies were moved back one spot. But there was something curious about this. It left Disney without any large theatrical releases for winter and most of spring 2022, which had been a successful period for Marvel titles. The film that left that early spring break spot, Doctor Strange 2, was largely done and had originally been set to premiere back in May of 2021. There were some reshoots going on for the film at the end of 2021, but as this production was originally slotted for a release months ago, I can't imagine that any of these reshoots were significant. Once these dates were announced, I checked the remaining Disney titles left on the release schedule. With these shifts, aside from some quiet Fox films, Disney effectively vacated its release schedule from November 24th with Encanto all the way through March 11th with Pixar's Turning Red. I'd say that this was my first tip-off, that back in October, at least the film divisions within the Disney organization were sensing possible trouble during the coming winter months. And remember... Turning Red is a Pixar film. Disney has felt comfortable releasing the last two Pixar films, Soul and Luca, directly to Disney Plus due to issues with COVID. And if you remove Turning Red from the equation, Disney effectively removed all films by Walt Disney Pictures and Marvel Studios from November until May, nearly a half year. I doubt anyone inside the company back then understood that a variant then expanded in South Africa would cause disruption in the U.S., but all through the pandemic, Disney has been tapped into information that has created predictions that are extremely reliable. And this was the first tip-off that at least some divisions inside the company had concerns about winter. I should point out that the Disney organization is essentially about 35 individual companies or individual divisions, from consumer products to Lucasfilm to the Disney World Resort to Imagineering, and these companies or divisions don't always move in the same direction as they have a good deal of autonomy. So even though the film divisions seem to be flagging signs that COVID concerns were likely to disrupt their business model again, other divisions weren't flagging those signs as strongly. In part, this is due to the film divisions having more options than other divisions in Disney. Disney can always delay the release of an expensive film until conditions are more advantageous 
They can also shift a film project over to Disney Plus to increase the subscription base or at least to reduce churn. But parks, cruises, and other experiences have no meaningful way to produce income if they aren't open to the public. So even if all divisions inside of Disney had access to the same information, some divisions might have been more inclined to alter their business model for a few months than other divisions. In terms of the American parks, Fall was the smoothest period for attendance and capacity expansion since March 2020. Disney World opened a new attraction and premiered multiple nighttime shows. Disneyland returned to having a daily parade. At one point, the plan was clearly to expand capacity in the American resorts over the fall so that for the lucrative winter holidays, the parks would be back to something close to normal, essentially moving from about 50% of capacity at the American parks at the end of summer to an unspecified target capacity that might have been 80% or higher for the winter holidays. Though Disney has stopped, releasing capacity percentages from spending time in both resorts over fall, I'm fairly sure the Florida resort reached higher capacity percentages than the California parks. On busy days, the Florida parks felt and looked more crowded than the California parks. The Florida resort was also more incentivized to expand capacity as it has tens of thousands of hotel rooms to fill. But then came the problems with Omicron. On December 2nd, the CDC moved Orange County, Florida, where most of the Disney Resort is located, from moderate to substantial in terms of level of COVID infections. On December 22nd, the CDC moved Orange County to the high tier with 7.3 positivity in tests and well over 1,000 new cases per day. Shortly after Orange County was shifted to the high tier, Universal Orlando announced that starting Christmas Eve, all guests and team members, regardless of vaccination status, would now need to be masked in indoor areas, similar to the protocols at Disney, and also in queues, whether or not the queues were indoors, essentially from the moment a guest enters a line to the moment after they exit the ride building. This portion of the announcement was a more strict policy than what was currently enforced by Disney, where only the indoor portion of a queue required masks. To transition to a related topic for a moment, mask usage at Disney parks I found is an interesting barometer of how the public is managing the situation with COVID. And there are clearly differences in attitudes between the California and Florida parks. But mask usage at both resorts changes as infection levels go up and then go down. I'll put a few observations up front. For months, the California and Florida resorts have had lockstep policies on masks. They are required indoors except when eating or drinking. And they are optional outdoors. But voluntary outdoor mask usage at the California resort is typically about 10 to 20 percent higher, regardless of other factors, than at the Florida resort. I can support this percentage with samples from multiple days. But almost counterintuitively, those visiting the Florida parks tend to follow the rules more pervasively than those at the California parks. Guests at the Florida parks tend to wear masks when required, whereas in California, a small group of guests consistently removes their masks once the ride vehicle leaves the boarding area. That is, guests at the Florida resort tend to go with the system more, whereas some guests at the California resort tend to quietly rebel in line with their beliefs system. Anyway, during the height of the Delta wave back in mid-September, voluntary outdoor mask usage at the California park, despite the heat, was between 33 and 35 percent of the people in the park. In other words, one-third of guests voluntarily chose to wear masks outdoors during a period of high community spread. By mid-October, as the Delta wave subsided, outdoor mask usage was between 28 and 30 percent, and then by November 12th, as cases continued to decline, it was down to 26 percent. At the start of December, 
as very early concerns about a small number of Omicron cases in the U.S. emerged, mask percentages moved up slightly to 29%. But then, only one week later, as Omicron quickly moved into the U.S., I was seeing percentage counts consistently above 40%, including one morning count at Disneyland that averaged out to 47%, the highest I've ever seen. If nothing else, this trend expressed that those visiting felt a far higher level of vulnerability in a theme park in December than they had back in November. It also showed that as cases go up, voluntary masking follows, and as cases go down, voluntary masking does the same. On the other side of the country, the trends were a little different. In Florida, in early October, voluntary mask usage outdoors at the parks was about 12%, with one exception. The percentage climbed to 22% as crowds gathered for the fireworks. In other words, guests felt that outdoor crowds on Main Street for the fireworks represented a higher risk than other outdoor activities at the park, even during a period of low community infection. In November, as infection levels were again low, mask usage remained around 12%. But then, a few days before Christmas, as Omicron infections expanded significantly in the U.S., voluntary outdoor mask usage at the Florida parks rose to 20%, a quick increase of 8%. This was on Sunday, December 19th. Again, this showed how practices were shifting in Florida based on infection levels in the community. But there was one other element that interested me in the Florida numbers, specifically how much of that mask usage could be attributed to tourists. In California, most visitors are locals, and mask usage inside the park roughly matched mask usage in crowded areas outside the park. But it was my observation that in most outdoor settings outside of the Disney parks in Florida, voluntary mask usage even in crowded areas was fairly rare, which suggested that some of the masking was done by traditional tourists coming from regions where mask wearing was more common. So on the same day that I had a 20% finding from the Magic Kingdom, I went over to the town of Celebration, not far from Disney World, where they were holding an outdoor craft fair and farmer's market. It covered roughly three city blocks, and inside those three blocks, crowds were roughly as dense as in the area of the Magic Kingdom where I'd counted masks earlier in the morning. But unlike the Magic Kingdom, this craft fair and farmer's market would be attended mostly by locals. I picked a spot and counted out 300 people who passed by. Of those, only 9% were wearing masks. This suggests that the tourist component at Disney World accounts for a significant portion of voluntary mask wearing. This is also one of the underlying reasons why Disney World, despite being in a region with lower mask usage, is unlikely to abandon indoor mask requirements anytime soon. A certain percent of traditional tourists, i.e. guests staying at Disney hotels, are so accustomed to mask usage that they will wear masks even when not required outdoors, even if only one in five people join them in this voluntary mask usage. As Bob Chapik has painfully pointed out in multiple recent sales calls, these traditional tourists contribute more to the resort's bottom line than do day guests and locals. There are some interesting takeaways from all of this, I think. Voluntary masking on both coasts is partially driven by reported levels of infection outside the parks. Assuming this holds true, you will almost certainly see more outdoor masking if you visit the parks in January. Not surprisingly, voluntary outdoor masking is more common at the California parks than at the parks in Florida. And in Florida, a meaningful percent of mask wearing seems to be attributed to those visiting from outside of Florida. And as for that big question, will Disney relax indoor mask requirements anytime soon? Well, at the California parks, they can't. There is a statewide mask mandate right now. And at the Florida parks, they can, but I think it's unlikely. 
In part, it's easier for Disney to have one pervasive policy that covers all of its parks and resorts in the U.S. for a long period of time, as opposed to multiple policies that often change, which leads to confusion. And in part, Disney is no doubt aware that some of the voluntary masking that happens outdoors is attributable to traditional tourists, perhaps visiting from New York, Boston, or Chicago, which are the exact deep pocket markets that Disney wants to entice back into the parks. Removing the indoor mask requirement may push some of these visitors outside of their comfort zones to the point where they delay travel. But the mask requirement has one unique downside in the months ahead, the Galactic Star Cruiser. This is that Star Wars hotel arranged as a high dollar two night role playing experience where guests are surrounded by actors to create an otherworldly experience. Back when Delta was waning, I'd lay money that Disney believed an early March date would be outside most COVID health concerns. Acting requires, among other elements, facial gestures to communicate mood and emotion. Masks aren't great for this, but the Galactic Star Cruiser, instead of opening during a period of low COVID concern, will likely open during the back end of the largest spike of infections experienced so far in the U.S. Even Universal Orlando, which had for months tried to operate as though nothing much was wrong, is requiring guests to mask up indoors again, so there's little chance that the mask situation will change in less than two months for the Star Cruiser, a hotel with no outdoor areas and no windows. And this will cause concern for Disney in both how to deliver an immersive experience on the Star Cruiser and how those initial guests, who no doubt will post photos and review, will perceive this experience. But anyway, Back to our larger story about how the Omicron variant is changing the American resorts in general. Though the film divisions inside Disney had previously pivoted to account for COVID-related problems during winter, the American resorts, and more specifically the Florida resort, had not. The Florida resort found themselves moving into the holiday season, a period that they'd earmarked as a return to near-normal operations, a period for which they had already accepted a higher number of park reservations, at the same time that the U.S. was entering a period with unusually high levels of infections. How high? Let me put this in perspective. Back in June, as Disney World began to move forward with plans to increase capacity, hopefully toward a near-regular holiday season, daily infection levels in the U.S. were down to around 12,000 per day. Even after that Delta spike last fall, daily infections again dipped down to a manageable level of about 70,000 per day. Fast forward now to this week. According to the New York Times on December 27th, the number of new COVID cases in the U.S. was over a half million, specifically 543,000. And it's possible that some of this might have been an extended backlog from Christmas, but the following day, December 28th, the number of cases was 380,000, roughly a 3,000% increase from June. And then on December 29th, long after any Christmas backlog should have been cleared, new cases were again up to 489,000. These increases also come at a time when many Americans are experiencing COVID fatigue and have strong desires for more normal experiences. Disney World also has strong financial incentives to return to more normal operations as well. A few weeks ago, Disney announced that it would open the last of its shuttered hotels and also bring back guided tours such as Keys to the Kingdom, which traditionally moves between indoor and outdoor spaces, to their list of offerings. We'll talk about these a little more in a later section of today's episode, but the larger question here is this. How deeply will the current wave of Omicron affect visitation at the American resorts? For this, I have a twofold answer. First, in California, I think it will be minimal, unless there are government-required closures of mass entertainment centers, which I see as an outside possibility. For months, the California governor has shifted control to individual counties concerning issues of vaccination and mask requirements, 
L.A. County, for example, where Universal Studios Hollywood is located, requires proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test for entry into any theme park located within this county, while Orange County, where Disneyland is located, does not. But in December, as Omicron began to move across the country, the California governor's office again took control of some statewide requirements announcing that indoor masks were required in all counties across the state. This trend opens up the outside possibility that mass entertainment centers, if hospitals are deeply impacted later this winter, might close again though I think this is an outside possibility and one that is more tied to hospital capacity than infection levels. But those elements aside, I don't think that the Omicron variant will deeply impact visitation at the California resort. From experiencing crowd levels in the California and Florida parks on sold out days, I'm fairly confident that the percentage capacity at Disneyland is presently meaningfully lower than that of the Florida parks. Again, remember that Disney World is essentially a different division of the Disney company than Disneyland, with each resort having some autonomy in how policies are developed. The Omicron variant may depress the number of traditional tourists at the Disneyland hotels. It may affect indoor dining. But I don't think there will be deep changes to the overall crowd levels at the parks. Weekdays will be modest. Weekends, especially in the evening, will still have small crowds. But I do think that Omicron is going to significantly depress visitation to Disney World for the next few months. In part, this has to do with planning. Beyond a heightened level of infections, Omicron has introduced elements of unpredictability for families planning an expensive vacation. Simply, families are more likely to plan a $5,000 or $10,000 vacation when there's a high degree of reliability that it will turn out well with few problems. There's a range of small problems right now that will affect vacations issues with the supply chain, shortages of chefs and cooks in Disney World restaurants, shortages of housekeeping staff, and a lack of staff to effectively manage peak days. But the most significant reason that Disney World will see lower tourism in the coming months is the disruption to air travel. At the moment, Disney World is primarily visited by domestic tourists, and as Omicron expands across the country, Americans are watching and reading reports of flight crews calling in sick with COVID, which in turn has delayed or canceled thousands of flights. Between Christmas Eve and December 29th, 7,000 flights in the U.S. were canceled largely because airlines didn't have flight crews to staff the flights. Alaska Airlines went so far as to ask travelers to change existing non-essential travel to later dates. At the urging of Delta and other airlines, on Monday, December 28th, the CDC revised down its isolation guidance for those testing positive for COVID, in some cases from 10 days down to 5 days, in part to free up asymptomatic flight crew members who previously tested positive. But this also left some travelers feeling uneasy about the health safety of their flights. These cancellations left thousands and thousands of families stranded in cities far from home. The image of these crowds stranded in airports perhaps more so than fears of COVID will depress traditional tourism to Orlando until months after the Omicron variant has subsided. Simply, the specter of not being able to return home for days and being bumped from flight to flight is too significant of a burden for many families to face for leisure travel. Or to put it this way, if I'm traveling for work, I'm traveling solo. If my flight is canceled, I'll flip open a laptop and focus on work for a few hours, maybe even a day or two. I have with me at most a backpack and one 22-inch carry-on suitcase. A canceled flight is an inconvenience around which I can still work. But if I'm traveling with my family, with my kids... I have multiple suitcases, likely I am or at least was relying on a rental car, and I need to keep other people comfortable and entertained during the delay, which, if it stretches out more than a few hours, can undercut the enjoyment and rest potential of the entire vacation. This generally is what is going to depress tourism to Orlando for at least the first few months of 2022.
Another problem for Florida tourism is that its percentage of new cases is again outstripping national averages, though not as significantly as during the Delta wave. Back in the fall, Florida tourism was depressed because that state held a higher level of infection than any other region. At one point, Florida had 25% of the nation's COVID infections, which was widely reported on the news. On the day this past week that the United States posted 543,000 new COVID infections, Florida posted 73,000. Florida has about 6.5% of the nation's population, but on that day, Florida had roughly 13.5% of the nation's new cases. For the seven-day trailing average, Florida has about 15% of the nation's new cases, which is more than double the national average. And then on Friday, December 31st, Florida posted over 75,000 new cases in a single day, which was the highest number of one-day infections, not only for Florida, but for any state ever. This story hasn't yet played out in the national news, as a similar story did in August and September, but there remains the potential for this to be picked up as a news story as the Omicron wave expands. Also, the information is there for any potential traveler who might check it before booking a trip. In general, I think we're moving into a period where more people are talking about living with COVID rather than isolating from it. There's a building fatigue from managing COVID, from health precautions to health anxiety, which has produced strong yearnings for more normal experiences, such as delayed or canceled vacations initially scheduled during the past two years. But as a complex society, we don't yet have the tools, at least not yet, to effectively live with COVID. The biggest example from this past week has been the thousands of canceled flights due to airlines having flight crews infected with COVID. But with an increase of reliable home tests with drug treatments to reduce the severity of COVID, and with vaccines that can be reconfigured to more effectively protect against new variants, we're moving in a direction where something like normal life can be better managed. But even here, there still needs to be thought given to the possibility of long COVID, which is an unknown for Omicron and for ways to protect the elderly and the immune compromised. For the next month or two, from the models I've seen, we're likely headed into yet another difficult period of the pandemic. The University of Florida doesn't expect Omicron to peak until February. At the moment, we're seeing spikes in infection levels. We're starting to see a rise in hospitalization rates, but it isn't yet at levels comparable to Delta, which may be a good sign. Recent studies show that this variant may target different aspects of the respiratory system than previous strains of COVID. This following quote is from the New York Times, quote, In studies of mice and hamsters, Omicron produced less damaging infections, often limited largely to the upper airways, the nose, throat, and windpipe. The variant did much less harm to the lungs where previous variants would often cause scarring and serious breathing difficulty. New daily infections of Omicron in Florida have already far exceeded those experienced during the Delta wave. But at least so far, hospitalization rates, though quickly rising, are meaningfully below those of the Delta wave when comparing the percentage of those infected to the percentage of those hospitalized as the spike began. But as we're still learning exactly how this variant works, it would be a good idea to monitor hospitalization rates for another couple of weeks, as hospitalization spikes always lag behind infection spikes. The overall takeaway, as I see it, is this. The situation will get worse in January, but the severity of the disease, though serious, may not be as severe as the disease produced by Delta. In this, there's a wait-and-see, hope-for-the-best element as well. But let me end the first segment of this update with this observation. Even though there are ongoing concerns with infections, and even though the parks are not back to normal, COVID has made me more appreciative of the time I am able to spend in the parks each time I walk down Main Street or venture past Spaceship Earth.
The California resort was closed for over 400 days. And beyond that, for me, with concerns about air travel, I didn't visit the Florida resort for many months as well last year. And despite the limited menus at many restaurants and the need to reserve days, despite other problems as well, I experienced small moments of gratitude each time I entered the parks, knowing that not long ago, maybe a year ago, during the truly dark days of this pandemic, the primary way I experienced the park was on YouTube, and now I'm back there in person. And that last part, I think, is my one big suggestion for this episode. If you're going to the parks, even if everything is not perfect, look for that sense of enjoyment when you walk through the turnstiles, as that helps solidify the comfort of being there. We all need a place to decompress, especially with the problems facing the world right now. And if the parks are your place to decompress, try to put aside the negatives and focus on what you enjoy, as you'll feel better about your experience once you return home. But as this is an update about the material and social changes around the Disney company, I also recognize that there has been a growing wave of discontent directed at the parks, largely from longtime fans. For the moment, I'm going to leave Genie Plus out of this conversation. Next week, we'll focus on the pros and cons of Genie Plus, which will include a section focused on when and how to use it to your advantage. And I do think there are some pros to this new system, along with a couple of obvious cons. But again, that's for next week. Genie Plus aside, I'm hearing a growing chorus of discontent from longtime fans about both the California and the Florida resorts. In California, the complaints have three centers. First, limited menus at restaurants, long lines for food, and disappointing meals. Second, a lack of services such as regular housekeeping available at on-property hotels. And third, difficulty obtaining reservations for popular days, particularly for Magic Key holders. For those concerned about food, I can only say I share some of your frustrations. There are clearly staff shortages and supply issues affecting the California resort. But also... I've yet to have a bad meal at the Lamplight Lounge at DCA or the Craftsman Grill at the Grand Californian. Both are modestly priced table service restaurants. Add to this list Bengal Barbecue at Disneyland for a counter service meal. I've found these three restaurants to be far more reliable than Riverbell Terrace or Carnation Cafe or even Blue Bayou. My guess this situation, though frustrating, will improve over 2022. Likewise, Disney reintroduced annual passes in California and Florida at the start of fall with the belief that the COVID situation after Delta would gradually improve through the rest of the year, allowing the parks to dramatically increase capacity. This simply didn't happen. One frustrated guest went so far as to file a lawsuit over reservation availability. I agree the situation's not ideal, but also as the health situation improves, reservation ability should improve as well. As a personal side note, I've never not been able to find a reservation for a date I wanted to visit. Sometimes this requires checking the app many times until another guest cancels. Also in California, as guests receive a strike against their account if they have an unused reservation, many guests cancel reservations each evening, typically between 9 p.m. and midnight, for reservation slots the following day. To avoid a strike, you need to cancel by midnight. During these hours, typically, availability opens up fairly deeply at both parks for anyone interested in going the following day. Again, this is not an ideal situation and not a good situation for traditional tourists, but I found this to be a workable solution for those like me who can simply drive to the resort. The wave of fan frustration directed toward the Florida resort is wider and more complex because beneath some elements is a revision to a longtime business model that framed the Disney vacation experience for the past two decades. The overall litany of frustrations includes many elements that have changed in the past two years. 
First, the absence of the Disney dining plan, also difficulty in obtaining certain dining reservations at all. The underlying cause here is related to staff shortages in the Disney World kitchens. According to the trade journal Restaurant Business, as of December 3rd, the leisure industry employed 7.9 fewer workers than it did just before the pandemic, a situation largely attributable to hospitality and leisure workers moving to other fields while restaurants and hotels were closed. This situation has grown so serious that Disney is now just throwing money at the problem by offering hiring bonuses, particularly for kitchen workers. A dishwasher and a steward who generally cleans grills and other areas of the kitchen can receive a $1,000 hiring bonus. A line cook or pastry chef can receive a $3,000 hiring bonus. This is a job that pays $19 an hour, so this is nearly a full month of pay. A chef assistant with four years experience as a line cook or an experienced pastry chef moving from out of the area can receive a $6,000 hiring bonus. This is a job that pays $20 per hour, so this is a bonus nearly equivalent to two months' salary. There are literally dozens of these jobs in Disney kitchens being advertised right now. In short, Disney has been able to fill many vacancies at the resort by reopening the college program. But skilled full-time kitchen workers remain difficult for the resort to attract and hire, which has led to limited menus, closed restaurants, and reduced reservations. This problem, too, will likely sort itself out as the pandemic improves. But in short, the dining plan can't reopen until kitchens are more fully staffed. Second, the Florida Park Reservation System has produced a set of complaints beyond the reservation system itself, in that the new system requires guests to wait until 2 p.m. before changing parks and also requires guests to enter their reserved park first, even if they arrive after 2 p.m. before park hopping. In practice, I can tell you this requirement is unique to Florida. In California, where the parks are a few hundred feet apart, I've been able to reserve one park and then arrive late in the day and immediately enter the other park first. But in terms of dispersing guests between the various parks, there is some rationale to this plan. It ensures that no one park, such as the Magic Kingdom, is overrun with crowds, and by the time park hopping begins, a certain percentage of guests, particularly those with children, are headed back to their hotels for an afternoon nap or pool break. This system, in my opinion, not only helps Disney with staffing, but ensures for guests that the parks are enjoyable without overwhelming crowds. Third. Another common complaint, the old Future World section of Epcot is a maze of construction walls. They stretch from the old Universe of Energy Pavilion all the way to the Imagination Pavilion. On this, I have a few opinions. Parks need to be updated, and generally I think it's better to focus deeply on one park rather than to have rampant construction throughout all four parks at the same time. Seven years ago, construction was focused on New Fantasyland in the Magic Kingdom, then it was the Galaxy's Edge Toy Story Land redo of Hollywood Studios, now it's the old Future World section of Epcot. And yes, there was a lost opportunity here to push through more of the hardscape construction while the park was empty in 2020 and early 2021. So that lost opportunity increases some regular visitors' sense of frustration, but the overall plan to revamp a major section at one park over a two or three year period is not a bad plan when compared with other similar options. Fourth, there have been some grumblings about a lackluster 50th anniversary celebration that was mostly focused on merchandise. This complaint, I feel, is not entirely fair, as there was a legitimate plan to add major attractions to three of the four parks for the 50th, coupled with parades and other activities, but this plan was completely derailed by COVID, which was outside of the company's control. But then there are a few complaints that I think have a level of legitimacy. And also, as a person who has watched the company develop for years, truly confuse me. 
The first is the replacement of the free FastPass system. The free FastPass system deeply benefited on-site guests and incentivized many to stay at Disney hotels. But the system was replaced with one that leveled out the vacation experience at a cost for all guests, both those staying on property and those staying off property. For certain guests, this is nothing more than an added expense. But for other guests, this actually may be a benefit. Again, we'll look at Genie Plus as a paid replacement to the Fast Pass system as the focus of next week's episode. The second is the response time from the Disney Reservation Center, or the DRC as it's known on property. At the moment when you call the Disney World Reservation Center, you can be put on hold for two or more hours. Emails sent to guest services can take weeks to receive a response. This is largely a staffing issue. But as these people are often the first contact for families wishing to book a vacation, long delays produces frustration, which in turn discourages people from booking a vacation they were planning to make. A number of people who work for the DRC are still working from home. Some have reported that guests' emails are now over two months behind. Hiring will fix this problem, but hiring is only the beginning. Once hired, DRC representatives need to be trained and supervised as they are placed into their roles. Another person explained that most, if not all, DRC representatives have been put on 10 hours a week of mandatory overtime for the month of January in an attempt to catch up with this backlog of requests and communications. Also, though January is typically a slow month, cast members at the Disney Reservation Center have seen vacation requests blocked out for that month as well. This is a problem that, because of its importance in generating income for Disney, shouldn't have reached this level of severity. But I've also been told that Disney is trying to hire to solve the staffing shortage as quickly as possible. And the third change that confuses me is the removal of the Magical Express bus system, which funneled traditional tourists flying into MCO directly into the Disney bubble, where they stayed until a similar bus at the end of their vacation took them back to the airport. I should point out for listeners that as of January 1st, the Magical Express is mostly done. Magical Express will no longer pick up guests from the airport, but until January 10th, Disney is running some buses to take guests checking out from a Disney hotel back to the airport. The removal of this service opens the door to guests staying off property or booking a rental car to more easily visit other parks in the area. One of the features that distinguished the Disney model from other types of vacations was the all-inclusive bubble. Guests were given free transportation to the resort, and in exchange for the most part, they only visited Disney parks and ate at Disney restaurants. There are some systems that have cut into this model in recent years, such as grocery and Amazon deliveries to hotels, but the advantage here, at least as I see it, belonged to Disney. Without the magic Magical Express to funnel guests directly into on-property hotels, guests are more likely to book hotels off-property, eat off-property, and if they have a rental car, see what Universal and SeaWorld have to offer. I see some possible short-term gains from the removal of Magical Express, but also some very deep long-term costs, which is my overall point of confusion. Mirrors, which ran the Magical Express for years, is introducing a replacement system called Mirrors Connect. It will be run more or less like the Magical Express, taking guests from the airport directly to Disney hotels. Only it won't have the Disney branded images arranged into their buses. The service will now cost $32 round trip per adult and $27 per child. But the announcement of the fare presents an interesting question. Clearly, Disney wasn't paying full fare for Magical Express. That is, they weren't on average paying mirrors $32 per adult. Maybe they were paying $25, though I would wager it was less. But let's go with $25. We'll use $25 as Disney's average cost per guest for this service. For the removal of the Magical Express to make long-term financial sense for Disney, 
Disney would need to project that they would recoup more than $25 per guest previously using the service, and this doesn't ring true. If guests are mostly trapped within the Disney bubble for a seven or five or even a three-day vacation, how many more meals do those guests need to eat on property before Disney sees an extra $25 in profit? My guess, less than two. And if guests even swap out one day at Disney for a day at Universal, that's far more than a $25 loss. Add into this, for some, the replacement of a Disney hotel for an off-site hotel, which would be a sizable loss per visitation. It should be pointed out, in fairness, that Disney may recoup some of these losses through parking fees for families who take a rental car from the airport over to the resort, as on-property hotels, except for the DVC, now charge a nightly fee for parking. But even with this, I suspect that over time, there will be a large gulf between the money Disney saved by abandoning the Magical Express and the money Disney received by keeping more guests confined to their property. For years, Disney created a system whereby a Disney World vacation was similar to a cruise ship. Guests take a shuttle from the airport over to the resort, and though it's possible for them to take an Uber or a Lyft off property, most Magical Express guests simply stayed put on property with their meals provided by Disney. Visitors from Europe and England in particular were willing to let Disney drop them off at their hotels where they remained for an extended vacation simply to avoid dealing with the unfamiliar U.S. highway system. The removal of the Magical Express will create different travel patterns for many visitors who book a rental car which allows easy access off property. In this model, with rented transportation, Disney World can now be just one stop, a significant stop in a larger Central Florida vacation with time spent at Universal, Legoland, the Cape, and the beach. In short, this will push more families toward taking a Central Florida vacation, which includes Disney, rather than a dedicated Disney vacation. Next week, we'll take a deeper look at how this unbundling of services is affecting the larger Disney World vacation as we explore Genie Plus, and also look at the benefits of staying on property versus the benefits of staying off property in this new model. But for now, I'd simply like to say that this move by Disney confuses me. The shifting of a business model almost always requires some short-term losses to reach long-term gains, for example, to launch the Disney Plus streaming service, which was a business model change, Disney needed to forego money from Netflix contracts and also accept lower box office totals to shift viewers over to a dedicated streaming service that hopefully will produce long-term profits. Likewise, Genie Plus is a calculated move by Disney in which the company believes that it will see higher profits despite the present grumblings, assuming the system catches on. Though I may not like all aspects of Genie Plus, I can see how the company stands possibly to increase its overall income with the service. But the removal of the Magical Express confuses me, as $25 per visitor was a small price to pay to ensure that guests at Disney World stay for the most part on property and spend the lion's share of their vacation dollars there. So what is ahead for these next few months? It's possible that the Omicron variant builds quickly, cresting in early February, and then declines just as quickly, perhaps into March. But the removal of one variant doesn't guarantee that other disruptive variants won't emerge later in 2022. In December, Omicron required a four-week build from low levels of COVID at the start of the month to extremely high levels of new infection at the end of the month. If March produces a decline that works just as quickly, Disneyland could recover to pre-Omicron business levels a week or two later. But as we've already discussed, it's going to take longer for a wave of traditional tourists to return to Florida. Over Christmas week, there were heavy crowds at the Florida parks, but these were people who mostly booked months ago when infection levels were low and the nation was hopeful that the Delta wave was the last significant wave of COVID. In the weeks after Delta was in decline, 
the Florida parks remained empty, even though part of that period, such as the second half of October, was a traditional period of high visitation. I'd expect a similar ramping up after Omicron. Once Omicron has crested and is in definite decline, demonstrated over multiple weeks, it should still take a month or two before regular crowds again swell in the Florida parks. Spring break will pull in some crowds, as part of spring break activity includes young people driving to the resort. But I think it's more likely that we'll need to wait until late April or May to see a larger wave of traditional tourists in Central Florida arriving by plane. But to entice guests to visit, Disney is working to expand out experiences at both the California and Florida resort. After having its opening date pushed back multiple times, Disney announced that the All-Star Sports Resort will reopen on March 31st, 2022. This is the last of the Disney hotels to reopen. I've been through the hotel resort areas recently in Florida, and I'm not sure that those hotels presently open are even using all of their capacity. And so again, I'm somewhat surprised by this announcement. Disney already has 4,000 rooms that are potentially available over at All Star Music and Movies, and again, I'm not even sure that all the rooms over at Music and Movies are presently in the active guest inventory. At this point, I'm unsure as to the value of adding yet another hotel into the active inventory unless it's to train cast members in the operation of a resort area that by the time it reopens will have been closed for over two years. There also may be a need to work within buildings and rooms that have been shuttered for two years to slowly bring the entire complex back online. But again, with Omicron surging, I wouldn't be surprised if the opening date for All-Star Sports was pushed back once more. Also, after a nearly two-year absence, Disney announced that behind-the-scenes tours will return to Disney World, but not Disneyland, on February 6th. This grouping of tours is mostly staged outdoors. The three tours at Animal Kingdom, including Up Close with Rhinos, Caring for Giants, and Wild Africa Trek, are largely outdoors except for a short shuttle ride for two of these tours to bring guests to animal care areas backstage. At the Magic Kingdom, the Keys to the Kingdom tour will also return, though this tour, at least in its pre-pandemic form, moves guests through indoor utilidors beneath Disney World to glimpse the world of cast members for 30 or 40 minutes. I think that most of these tours can be operated relatively safely, even in an environment of increased infection, though I wouldn't be surprised if Keys was modified to keep guests out of the utilidors, and I also wouldn't be surprised if these tour dates were pushed back until after the Omicron wave declines. As with airlines, if Omicron continues to surge, Disney will be faced with cast member shortages due to illness, and they may find that opening new tours is not a high priority item. These tours, I should point out, only represent a small portion of the overall Enchanting Extras collection that existed before the pandemic. The marquee attraction to entice families to book a Florida vacation later in 2022 will be Cosmic Rewind, the indoor coaster theme to the Guardians of the Galaxy over at Epcot. This presently has a summer 2022 date, which could mean anything from May all the way out to summer. Ideally, the coaster will get a May opening date, which will drive summer attendance. Though the coaster is not yet finished, I believe it's far enough along so that a summer 2022 date seems reasonable. Over at the Magic Kingdom, work continues on the Tron coaster. Recently, Disney left the Tron coaster off a list of new films and attractions that Disney would debut in 2022. Though I believe the Tron coaster could be completed before the end of 2022, I think 2023 is a far more likely opening date, largely because Disney has very little outside of this coaster to excite guests to plan a trip in 2023. 
A strategic decision might be to delay the opening of this coaster until after the end of the 50th anniversary celebration, which concludes in April 2023, and then build a summer 2023 promotion for the resort around this Tron-themed ride. But this also is where the current list of D and E ticket attractions presently under construction ends. There's Moana's Journey of Water over at Epcot. Construction has been moving forward on this for months. But this probably won't be the type of attraction that tempts families to spend thousands of dollars on another Disney vacation. At the parks presently, there's a few obvious areas for expansion. The show building previously occupied by Stitch's Great Escape is simply standing empty on a prime piece of Tomorrowland real estate. Primeval World at Animal Kingdom was recently removed. The spot is now occupied by a cement pad, which looks like the type of cement pad that will eventually support something more than stroller parking. But nothing yet has been announced. Not much has been mentioned recently about the transformation of the Wonders of Life Pavilion into the possible Play Pavilion. And lastly, Journey into Imagination is long overdue for an upgrade. For years, rumors have circulated about an inside-out reimagining of this attraction space. The attraction space is more than due for a refresh. On a personal note, I'd love for the park to simply turn the space back into the original Journey into Imagination attraction that premiered in 1982, which was lovely. Even now, I think that ride would sell a lot of Epcot plush. I think most of the ride track from the original ride is still there, though the back third of this show building is now used as the commercial wash and sanitation station for 3D glasses used at multiple attractions. I think they wash all of the eyewear for the resort except for the specialty glasses used at Flight of Passage. But I'm pretty sure that there's about a 0% chance of this plan happening, as the original Journey into Imagination attraction doesn't bring in any branded characters from the films. Out in California, the resort will expand outdoor entertainment with premiere dates tied to the spring. The resort will bring back a range of productions mostly at Disneyland. These include the Main Street Electrical Parade, the Disneyland Forever Fireworks, and the Tale of the Lion King, which was previously performed at DCA, but is now scheduled to fill the Fantasyland Theater. Over at DCA, the World of Color Fountain and Projection Show is slated to return as well. As opposed to those dates offered by Disney World for some returning experiences, these dates in California, tied to spring, seem far more realistic in terms of how they align with a likely rise and decline in COVID cases during the first half of 2022. With these offerings, next summer at Disneyland will be very close to a normal experience in terms of entertainment. And that, at least in terms of the park, sets up the opening months of 2022. Two years ago, in 2020, when I first started reporting on the COVID pandemic, I never thought that these issues would be the largest factor shaping the world of entertainment in 2022. At this point, I see cyclical patterns in COVID, which makes the analysis easier. But the elements that we've talked about here are mostly business stories. A long time ago, we talked about how, in narratives, disruptions almost always begin a story. Disruptions were the narrative mechanism that jolted characters or people out of their routines and made them sensitive to other areas of their lives. And that generally is what is happening to all of us still today. For Americans, World War II, from Pearl Harbor to its conclusion, lasted about four years. The worst of the Great Depression lasted about five years. For generations living today, this pandemic will be one of our shared stories, moments of personal history for which one version of yourself in your life existed before March 2020, with a slightly different one to emerge once all of this is finally over.
I'll be back next Sunday when we'll look at the ins and outs of Genie Plus as it works both at Disney World and Disneyland. As I mentioned a couple of months back, I wanted to see how this system worked during peak visitation periods, such as over the winter holidays, before I put together a practical guide that explored the best ways to use it. But we are now at the point where we can talk about the pros and cons of Genie Plus under a range of conditions. Lastly, we are an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we'd simply cease to exist. On this podcast, we explore two subjects. We create research-rich histories about the development of the Disney Studio and the Disney Parks, and we offer news and analysis focused on the ongoing evolution of the Disney Company. In recent months, we've explored the opening of Disney World. We've looked at the life of John Hench. We uncovered a lost interview with Ward Kimball. We looked at the history of the Jungle Cruise, and we've offered in-depth stories about the creation of Avengers Campus and the events related to the 50th anniversary of Disney World. If you enjoy these episodes, if you click in most weeks to listen to new stories, please support us by becoming a monthly subscriber over on Bandcamp. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. By subscribing, you will become one of the listeners who allows this podcast to keep going. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. As we're moving into some weeks where the health situation around us is going to be a little dicey, I hope that you take extra care to keep yourself safe. Remember, this pandemic isn't forever. Infection waves have been cyclical. So even if January is a difficult month, hopefully the months ahead, as with previous waves, will be much better. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.